Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. There's been a lot of turmoil in the teaching profession in the U.S. over the past several years. Teachers have been criticized, often viciously, by so-called reform advocates. There have been terrible job losses as a result of the Great Recession and budget cutbacks. The testing craze has spread like a wildfire out of control, and charter schools are competing with traditional public schools for scarce public dollars and for the hearts and minds of parents and students. We'll talk about all of this and more with my guest, Randy Weingarten, a former public school teacher and the longtime head of the American Federation of Teachers, the Teachers Union. Randy, welcome. It's great to be with you, Bob. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's start with um, what's the state of the teaching profession right now? How are teachers doing? What are their concerns? What's going on? Well, teachers are working. Teachers always worked hard, but teachers are working harder than ever. Many feel like they're on a hamster wheel <laughs> um, in that they know um, what to do, but they're told to um, do the kinds of things that don't make very much sense and to do it faster and faster and faster. So you see tremendous demoralization, but what I'm also seeing is a tremendous upt uptick in terms of a willingness to fight back and to fight forward and to be involved in a union because the union, you know, a union gives teachers the ability, the wherewithal to speak truth to power. And, and so when you're seeing this, the, you're not seeing what I think the right wing wanted, which was despair. So you see dem demoralization, but there's a sense of resilience and persistence that we are going to get this right. We're going to save public education. We're going to do this for our kids. We're going to do this for our democracy. And we're going to do this for our profession. Uh, we've lost a, a tremendous number of teachers over the past uh, several years. Part of it, I think, uh, because of the demoralization you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Teachers have just left the profession. A lot of it because of budget cuts that right. came from the Great Recession and, and um, all the uh, associated factors there. Um, fiscal problems. Um, how many teachers have we lost and what's been the impact of that in general on the schools? So you see several different trends colliding at the same time. But since, so there were three big, big pushes since the Great Recession. Number one is austerity. Number two, particularly since there wasn't a whole lot of private sector growth was this push for privatization, such as, you know, you see from Silicon Valley and from some um, of the edu entrepreneurs that anything that you do business-wise is going to be better than anything you do public-wise. Right. So, you know, the big tech can solve everything, that kind of push. So austerity, privatization, and then you also saw tremendous deprofessionalization. And so the austerity, what we saw since 2008 is the loss of about 10% of public education jobs, um, net loss of about 300,000 educators. Now, let's think about what that actually means. It means the loss of art and music. It means the loss of nurses, the paraprofessionals who help special needs kids. Um, so, that's, so what you're seeing is a lot of kids who have gotten poorer and poorer, 48% of our kids are Title I eligible, which means that they are at the poverty level, even though one-fifth of the kids in America are there. So that means that the, the public schools are disproportionately poor. But at the very time that, they need, that kids need more support, they're getting less support. And then on top of all of that, what you're seeing is that the biggest change pedagogically in terms of having the common core came in at the same exact time as you had austerity and privatization. And it came in with a push on testing first as opposed to a push on trying to figure out the support and the wherewithal to make this transition to critical thinking skills from rote memorization. Now all of these new issues that you're talking about that are confronting teachers and students in the classrooms uh, are part of um, uh, this sort of corporate style reform that's been in effect for several years now. We've had right. No Child Left b Behind, we've had Race to the Top, we've had these powerful foundations who have had a tremendous impact on the public schools. We've seen it for a lot of years 
in terms of um, academic achievement, uh, how successful has it been? Are we seeing the kind of improvement that they promised? No. I mean, so what's happened is that teachers, so let's, let's we have higher graduation rates in, 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 in public K-12, pre-K-12 education. We have higher math test scores. We have higher English test scores than ever before. But think about, close your eyes and think about what was promised. That if you use this kind of test and sanction, top-down test and sanction, essentially just shake those teachers up and because, you know, and just tell them what to do and test them based upon student test scores and they will be so shooken up, kids will soar. Right. Right? That was basically the theology behind particularly race to the top, and frankly, the theology behind some of No Child Left Behind and this test-based fixation. But what's happened, remember what Michelle Reed promised, Joel Klein promised, those leaps and bounds didn't happen. Right. What has happened is that teachers have figured out, even with everything thrown at them, even when they say that this stuff is wrong, they'll figure out how to knit together something to help kids learn. So that's why you're seeing incremental growth but frankly, using really the wrong strategies. And, and, and when, when you use the right strategies, meaning really engaging kids, having a real system of improving professional capacity building, and really attending to poverty and to the kind of um, social emotional issues, meaning treating kids, treating the whole child so when you do wraparound services around schools, treat kids like a whole child, engage them in curriculum, and help teachers ongoing, improve in an ongoing way, those schools and those districts soar. Just the opposite has been happening, though, with the obsession with testing. The focus has been on how to get the test scores up and thus exactly. teaching to the test as opposed to a much broader, richer um, curriculum. But how did this test mania get started? In the first place, how did it ever get such a foothold to the point where it's now the dominant force in public education? So I think what's happened is, you know, and, and, and Dana Goldstein in her new book, The Teacher Wars, pretty much nails this. I think we have a schizophrenia in education. There's an understanding that public education is one of the few highways in a, in a capitalist democracy that creates a ladder of opportunity for kids. And so it's one of the few things we give to Americans in terms of creating opportunity. At the same time, we don't support it well and we don't do other things to help kids. So we then assume that since it's the only thing that we do, you know, if it's not, we're, we're not doing something in an urgent way, if we don't have immediate results, it must be the teacher's fault. And that's the schizophrenia, because that's what created this test-based sanctioning, this um, top-down theology. And what you're really seeing is that the people that are farther and farther away from classrooms are the ones who are making these decisions that basically say just test kids and test teachers, close schools if, they, if the test results are not good, fire teachers if the test results are not good, and don't promote kids. So it's a sanction and, and um, test-based accountability system, which frankly, a lot of the folks who are promoting it, meaning the Walmart Foundation, the kind of billionaires who um, on the right wing, like the Koch brothers and things like that, and even the elite that push that, they actually don't send their kids to public schools. <laughs> if you talk to public school parents, what they want is great neighborhood public schools that are safe and welcoming that engage their kids and that are collaborative. And so we have, frankly, this huge schism. We knew it was important education, but this huge schism between those who actually use the schools and are embedded in communities 
and those who are far away and don't want to pay for what really works and frankly what they do for their own kids in private schools. In those private schools, these elite private schools that so many of the reformers, as you point out, send their children to, uh, they are not obsessed with testing in those schools. They have a broad, rich uh, curriculum. So there's um, exactly right. a little bit of a disconnect uh, and, there. And, and, what, and, and so let me be careful to say, there was a piece of No Child Left Behind that was really important, which is when, if you think that education is your only real vehicle to help kids create opportunity, you do want to see the data about where kids are, and you don't want to leave, as Marion Wright Edelman used to say, any child behind. So the data becomes important as a way to inform instruction. But it's not used as data anymore. What it is now is a weapon or a, or, or a, a, a vehicle to hammer schools as opposed to how do you improve instruction. And what the private schools understood um, for, a very, for a very long period of time is that when you engage kids through project-based learning, kids then learn how to critically think, they learn how to work in teams, and they learn how to navigate the world. And so that's the kind of work we should be doing in public schools. And that's the kind of work that you know schools like the Performance Consortium schools in New York City do, but they've had a really hard time trying to get a waiver from state education law requirements to do that kind of work. Not only did the reformers promise that these kids would flourish, but under No Child Left Behind, passed during the George W. Bush administration, the idea was that these reforms would help the children who were struggling the most, who were having the hardest time right. uh, academically. Uh, inevitably, those students were the, the poorest students, the ones that came from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. Very often they were uh, black or Latino. Um, aren't these the ones who are in fact being left behind? They're still the ones who are doing um, least well in school, and they're the ones who are benefiting the least from any of the reforms that are, for example, charter schools, which we'll talk about right. um, in, in a moment. So talk about the role that poverty plays and what's been happening to these impoverished youngsters in the public schools. The rich-poor achievement gap is far greater than any other uh, you know, cut of the achievement gap. There's a lot of people who will talk about the black-white achievement right. gap, but, and you know, we, in, we need to make sure that all kids succeed. Um, and, and there's not a person I know in public education who will rest until they know that every single child within our grasp um, can fulfill his or her potential. So ours is an all, is an all process, um, not some, but all. And what, but what we've seen historically is two thirds of the achievement gap is social economic issues. The, the you know, the, um, the, the achievement gap based upon class is far greater. Um, you know, two thirds the achievement gap based upon race, I believe. So the issue, poverty is a huge issue, but we've had this inane fight in the last few years between the people who call themselves the no excuses folk right. and everybody else. Now, I would say that one of the things that really hurt teachers is that teachers go into this profession to make a difference in the lives of kids. So somebody who's never spent 10 minutes in the classroom telling somebody who's in a classroom trying to meet the <laughs> needs of different kids, you know, that they have no excuses and, you know, that anything that we say is a problem infuriates teachers because that's part of the disrespect that they feel. So having said that, when you have kids who are poor, you need to actually create conditions for learning. What do I mean? Good housing. Help kids' parents get good jobs. If you want parents to come to schools, make sure we have childcare. Make sure we have meetings after schools. Help kids get dental services, health services help kids make sure that they're fed. We have an 85% increase in homelessness in the last few years in terms of kids coming to schools who are homeless. So you can't ignore these facts. You have to actually respond to them. You have to mitigate them. And so the no excuse crowd basically said, well, 
All of it is your responsibility. And teachers are basically saying, wait a second, we're willing to take the responsibility. We're first responders to this, but help us. Let's have the wraparound services. No, we don't have money for that. Let's have smaller class sizes. No, we don't have money for that. Let's make sure that kids get art and music. No, we don't have money for that. So that's been the de inane debate in the last few years, which I think is starting to change now. Charter schools get so much uh, attention, and they also get a tremendous, in many places, a tremendous amount of resources mm -hmm. uh, that otherwise would be going to traditional uh, public schools. But the original idea of charter schools, which a lot of people don't even know now, actually got perverted right. <laughs> along the line. Talk about what charter schools were originally supposed to be. So Al Shanker, one of my predecessors, was one of the original proponents of charter schools. And the goal was, let's give people closest to kids some flexibility from the rules and regulations of school systems to try doing something new, experiment with things. Because let's trust them that the parents know their kids best and that educators know their kids second best. Let's trust them to figure out what's good for kids. And then if the innovations work in an incubator kind of way, let's bring that back to the public, the bigger public system. And that was the original idea. And frankly, there you had, you know, you had these mom and pop charters growing up in lots of different places. And some of them worked and some of them didn't work. What then happened was a group of, of folks who saw this as a good business model then said, let's have a competitive model here. And that has been what's happened for the last 20 years with a lot of Take New York. There's a lot of hedge fund money behind, for example, you know, even Moskowitz's success um, schools, which are lodged and housed in New York City public schools. So they don't actually cost what they should cost because they get free rent from the New York City public schools. But they also get a lot of extra money and a lot of extra attention that, frankly, public schools in that same building would say, uh, can we have some of that too? And also what happens is that they don't take the same number of special needs kids or ELL kids or things like that. So what we've basically said to schools, I'm not even talking about the schools that have closed because of impropriety and corruption and things like that. What's happened after 20 years is that in some places, like in New York City, where Joel Klein totally fixated on the charter schools and made them, I wish he fixated on the public schools like he fixated on the charter schools, made them his you know, cherished um, you know, school system. In Success Academy schools are doing better than some of the public schools. In lots of other places throughout the country, it's the opposite. And what you see in an aggregate basis is basically the charters are doing the same as the rest of the public schools, even though they have um, the ability to expel kids and even though they don't take the same number of special needs kids. So what we've said is let's have a level playing field. Let's make sure that the public schools are well funded. Don't divert resources. If, if, a, if a state wants to spend money for, you know, for charter schools, spend money for it, but don't take it from other kids. And then also make sure that there's the same accountability and transparency requirements so that the charters are taking the same kids as the other publics are taking. And then let's see what happens. And if you have something in a charter that works, give it to us in the public system. And we should be clear about this. The overwhelming majority of American kids go to traditional public schools, Absolutely. Not, not charter schools, right? The overwhelming majority of kids. 90% of the kids in the United States of America, maybe it's 89%, maybe it's 91%, go to regular, to go to the, um, the traditional American public school system. And, but what's happened is that in places where there are lots and lots of charters, like Albany, New York, there's not enough money for the regular public system. And the regular public system hasn't improved because of that. Ironically, in a place like Chicago, the regular public schools, even though 50 of them were closed last year and things like that, are doing better than the charters. So it's not as if this was a silver bullet solution that worked, but it has actually hurt in terms of the draining of funding 
a lot of neighborhood public schools. One of the things that was peculiar right here in New York City, there was a long fight over whether mayors should have control of public schools. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, eventually got control of the public schools, nearly total control of the school system. I uh, would say it was absolute. You, <laughs> absolute control. Uh, Joel Klein, you pointed out, his chancellor, um, uh, made a big, big push for charter and other corporate style re reforms under the umbrella of mayoral control. Then you get a change of administrations. Bill de Blasio comes in, uh, a liberal mayor. Um, he wants to make some changes. That's where that big success academy fight uh, came from. And then the state legislature changed the rules. So what's happening here? Do we have mayoral control under mayors that, I don't know, uh, moderates or conservatives like, and not mayoral control if there's a liberal mayor? Well, there was a big irony in the way in which the state legislature, look, championed by, you know, the governor and others, changed those laws on the issue of rent for charters. I mean, at the end of the day, and, you know, that was, in my judgment, a bad change. Because at the end of the day, um, a charter school, and look, we run a couple of charter schools in New York City. The teachers union. The teachers union runs a couple of charter schools, and one of the schools that we run is doing really well, and one of the schools is struggling. And the one that's doing really well in the South Bronx, um, in the last three years, every, senior se every single senior that started the senior year graduated and went to college. So better results than Success Academy right. and many of the other high schools in New York City. So, so the, the real issue becomes, what are the needs of students? And you can't have a charter school squeeze out the needs of other students. And what that law did, the new law, is it actually said the charters have more preferences and have a premium over the traditional public neighborhood schools. And that's what was wrong with it. If people want to live together and there's, you know, there's equal, you know, there's equal resources and you're doing enough for the kids who go to neighborhood public schools, that's one thing. But that is not what's happening in many of this in many of these co-locations. And so, you know, that's been that's part of the problem. And I think you're right that it was ironic that mayoral control when it was Michael Bloomberg was okay, but that there were people who wanted to curb mayoral control when it was Bill de Blasio, even though Bill de Blasio himself has ceded a lot of voice back to parents. We only have about a minute left so that we don't give the impression that this is just one long sad tale. Uh, you've been visiting some uh, communities where there are bright spots on the education landscape. Talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So first, I think New York City, let me just say New York City, with the last contract negotiation between uh, Mayor de Blasio and Mike Mulgrew, there's some major bright spots in terms of the work that they've done. Second, there are districts all around the country that start with collaboration and trust that are changing this trajectory for kids. I've been to schools in the last month in Lowell, Massachusetts and Lawrence, Massachusetts, in Meridian, Connecticut and New Haven, Connecticut, in Houston, in Corpus Christi, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And what you see is when teachers are respected and given the kind of support they need to grow, when students have engaged curriculum where you're t focused on teaching and learning, not on testing, and when you have the wraparound services that kids need, you see kids thrive. It is doable and our challenge is how do we sustain, how do we scale up what we know, and how do we sustain it to ensure that all kids have that shot at success. I wish we had more time. This is great. Thank, um, you. thank you so much, Randy Weingarten. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The combined wealth of Americans has reached an all-time high. According to the Federal Reserve, the net worth of individuals, families, and nonprofit organizations rose nearly one and a half trillion dollars between April and June. Surely that should be good news. That's a lot of money. But here's the rub. 
Wealth in America is so unevenly distributed that most Americans, including those in the so-called solid middle class, are struggling. Even as we got the news about the rise in America's overall net worth, the U.S. Education Department was telling us that homelessness among school children was also rising. If we're richer than we've ever been, why are there so many poor people in America? And if we keep getting richer and richer, but most of that money goes to those who are already fabulously wealthy, how will we ever achieve a widely prosperous society with a large and secure middle class? The answer, of course, is that given our present approach, we'll never achieve it. If we really want the vast majority of Americans to do well economically, we will have to actively redistribute the nation's wealth. But no one wants to talk about that. That's all for now. See you next time.